Hello there, my name's Lorne Risley, host of Defunct Games News. I'll explain the attire in a moment. Uh, much like a PSP battery pack, this uh, show is going to be bursting with explosive content. Coming up this week. Unintentional, as a massive giga leak reveals never before seen game details for the SENS and the N64. Put a pin in the pocket as Analog announces its portable console is delayed. Another highlights to come include Capcom insisting a Mega Man movie is still in the works. Apologies for the get up, viewers. I'm investigating a lead. As you will have no doubt noticed, Cyril has been acting really strangely recently, giving me odd tasks to do in the show being more prickly than Mr. Prickly the Porcupine, and generally not being the relentlessly joyful sod I know and love. And by God, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I'm going to get to the bottom of what's really going on at Defunct Games. But uh, news always comes first, so uh, I suppose we should move on to our first story of the week. Well, we're waiting. While the world may seem to be sinking slowly into oblivion more and more these days, Nintendo appears to have sprung a leak of its own, and a big one at that, but it's the good kind of leak. It appears as though source code for classic Nintendo games on the Nintendo 64 and Super Nintendo Entertainment System have been leaked online by a number of anonymous posters, and fans have been digging through the data like truffle hounds on meth. Disclaimer, Defunct Games does not condone the use of crystal methamphetamine on canines. But which games, you ask? Try Mario 64, Mario Kart, Star Fox 1, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and Yoshi's Island. And for dessert, would Sir and Madam care to try a side order of never-before-released Star Fox 2 for the SENS? It goes great with Toad. Simply tons of unused assets including levels, sprites and character designs have been revealed with some really surprising and fun discoveries made, such as a scrapped Zelda 2 remake, plans for a Pokemon MMO for the Game Boy Advance based on Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green versions, Yoshi getting on that CrossFit, and what appears to be cute and cuddly sidekick Luigi telling us all what he really thinks of that spotlight thief Mario. Yeah! I mean, yeah. You tell him, my paisan. I know what it's like to play second fiddle to someone who gets all the glory and cake. We could go on for days touching on the mountain of unused assets that have turned up so far, but the most surprising element to this story is when Star Fox developer Dylan Cuthbert not only provided some legitimacy to the leak, but revealed to his surprise that hackers have happened across an old tool of his, adding he had no idea how they were able to obtain such an obscure piece of data 30 years after the fact. The leak has meant that fans of the series have not only gotten a unique perspective behind the scenes of making the game, but also an opportunity to speculate as to how these emissions have affected the games going forward, and what could have been had they been left in. And best of all, the data is far from tapped, so who knows what's going to be released in the coming weeks and months. More characters in Super Mario 64? Cancelled Luigi and Slippy spin-off game? Maybe not, given Nintendo has been very quiet concerning these leaks, and technically, you and I were never meant to see them. Could be anything, in fact. As a matter of fact, considering my current plight and my investigation, it might be worth looking through that data myself to see if there's anything that clues me into the current situation at Defunct Games. Okay, still clear here. Um, as always, I think it's uh, probably pertinent to take a look back at uh, the week in Defunct Games, so let's take a look at uh, the two, not one, but two reviews Cyril managed to crank, well, Cyril managed to crank out for you this week. The first being Clan N, where Cyril remarks, although it's easy enough to play through by yourself, Clan N is at its best when you bring friends along for the ride. The four heroes have a cool look, compelling backstory, and he's a fan of the simplistic pixel art design. What's more, the seven different minigames show that the first time developer is thinking about ways to shake up the action. That said, the game is a letdown by the repetitive gameplay and overlong story. Too much filler and frustrating technical problems keep Clan N from being the next great samurai brawler. Well, if you're looking to stay under the radar and you're not quite Sashimid out yet, I think this one might be worth a look at least. The second review was for Rigid Force Redo, and Cyril keenly notes, if you're new to the shoot 'em ups and haven't played through the classics that have made the genre what it is today, then I can see you having a lot of fun with Rigid Force Redo. It's fast paced, not too difficult, and easy to get into, no matter your expertise. However, if you've been playing shooters most of your life, then there isn't much here you haven't seen dozens of times before. It doesn't make the console debut from 
COM8, COM1 bad because the pieces are all there. But when your website boasts that Rigid Force Redo breathes new life into the classic side-scrolling shooter game, one expects a lot more than just another rehash of R-Type. At least makes the ship look different, it's the least you can do. I can personally attest to the abundance of similar content, especially with side-scrolling shoots. It's a bit like, you know, trying to tell the difference between them is trying to scrutinise exactly where Robert Patterson's acting ability is. Just, there's no telling where it starts or where it ends or even if it started to begin with. In any event, if you haven't done already, I would scoot across and go and check out those reviews immediately. And if you're in the mood for something more podcasty, we may have something for you in the coming days and weeks. taking too long. Right, uh, now before we begin with our next story, an apology. Here at Defunct Games we do our best to bring you up to date with any consumer products we feel may be worth your time. However this week we have to make a painful admission that the product in question may be about the greatest thing ever, rendering all our other miniaturized console references in the past few weeks completely irrelevant. So to apologize, here is some footage of a perfectly reasonable way to express your anger to us. With that out of our systems, Analog's portable console The Pocket has now been delayed until May of 2021. However, pre-orders are still being taken in August for the Play Anything You F***ing Like console. The console was scheduled to launch in 2020, but Analog announced, quote, Due to the unfortunate global state of affairs and supply chain challenges, The Pocket will now ship sometime in May 2021. Which is a crying shit. Which is a crying shame, because if you're not familiar with this little dime piece, let's take a run at some of the features it has up its... pocket. Similar to all of Analog's previous consoles, it has been built around a field programmable gate array, or FPGA for short chip, which is programmed to mimic the original circuitry of a console, which it can then play cartridges directly as if it were the official hardware, as opposed to typical retro consoles such as Astro City Mini or the Game Gear Micro, which typically run games through software emulation and updated hardware. The Pocket has between 6 to 10 hours of total playtime, Gorilla Glass that is three times thicker than the glass found on smartphone cases, and supports up to four controllers over its integrated Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz wireless hardware, or via USB. And while the Pocket does support, from the get-go, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, and Game Boy Color cartridges, after that, this is where it starts getting complicated and expensive. While the analog pocket and dock will be available to pre-order on August the 3rd, priced at $199 and $99 respectively, if sir or madam would like adapters for the Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket, Color, or the Atari Lynx, they are priced at $30 per adapter. In addition, up to four pockets can be linked for a multiplayer, but this will require additional cables and a basic pocket-to-pocket -pocket link cable, which again costs around $16. So if you're the sort of person that's a bit, you know, treats life like it is Pokemon and you, you gotta have it all, then you're talking about sinking about 400 bucks into it before you even get to the business of multiplayer. But given the console's versatility, the quality of its hardware, the fact that its newest feature is original display modes, which takes the Pocket's high quality LCD display and has it mimic the presentation and quirks of the screens of three currently announced handhelds, including Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, with potentially more to follow. The way I see it, all of that convenience, all of that nostalgia, in one handy, slit-looking device? It's wonderful to see this kind of thing come to fruition. And if we have to wait a little longer to get our hands on it, well, at least this gives us a bit of time for the developers and the producers of the product to see how well the battery lasts before it starts bursting at the seams. And as we bring this show to a close and I await my ever late contact, Let's take a look back at some of the news stories that you may have missed this week. But I was diligent enough to jot down for your viewing pleasure with less time than usual because I had to sneak out of the office while uh, no one was looking. Hideo Kojima, master of Metal Gear and weaver of plots so convoluted that not even the Enigma machine would tell him to hold its beer, may very well be ramping up the production of a brand new horror game. Speaking at Comic-Con 2020, renowned manga artist and enemy of the color spectrum, Junji Ito, says Kojima has opened up comms channels with him about working on a horror game and sought his collaboration for the artistic vision the game might take. Ito decided to keep his cards close to his chest, but was quoted as saying, I do know director Kojima, 
and we have been in conversation that he may have a horror-based game that he may be doing, and so he's invited me to work on that. But there are no details on it yet. This coupled with Kojima discussing his desire to return to the horror game genre in recent months, having completed Death Stranding, and looking for something new to overcomplicate, fans will no doubt be eager to see what he can produce, given the overwhelmingly positive reaction to the now infamous PT, or for the pedantic view of you, Silent Hills demo. And given the imagery that Ito is synonymous with, um, and, and what he's managed to produce, I'll be genuinely concerned because I'll be pants wettingly terrified, but too confused to understand why. More news from Comic Con 2020 is the directors of the upcoming Mega Man live action movie insist that it's still in the works and that they have big news coming soon. Henry Juiced and Ariel Shulman claim that the film is still in the works, but there was big news coming soon. I know, I just said that. Who wrote this this week? If anyone was here, I'd chastise them. Quote, we are super excited about it, said co-director Juiced. I think we're going to have some big news about it soon. I can't say all that much right now, but it's a project very near and dear to our hearts, and we're psyched. Co-director Shulman added, I like that it's an underdog hero. Both of us are deeply fascinated by robotics and the future of automation, for better and for worse, and I think trying to combine that into one of our favourite historical video games is the ultimate challenge. What? If you're that fascinated with robotics and automation, take a tour of a Toyota plant, guys. You don't have to murder the legacy of a famed superhero slash video game character to do that. Not to be outdone by Sega though, Capcom, the busy little bees that they are, state that the Monster Hunter movie starring Mila Jovovich has recently delayed from its original September release to the 23rd of April 2021 due to the coronavirus pandemic. The project is being written and directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, who's known for his work on various video game adaptations, including 1995's Mortal Kombat and the Resident Evil film series that ended with Resident Evil Final Chapter in 2016. And we all remember how faithful to the original source material and Academy Award winningly those films were, don't we? But if Capcom are willing to wage cine war against Sega after the success of Sonic the Hedgehog, much in the same way that DC took a run at Marvel after Avengers made all the money and then the rest of the money, well, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm certainly game for a bout of box office boxing. And finally this week, a modder has created a new Zelda adventure using the Ocarina of Time's engine. Typically working on modding Mario games, KZ Amanua, 100% I butchered that name, and a few of his friends created a new unofficial Zelda game in the Ocarina of Time engine titled The Legend of Zelda The Missing Link. Jeez, me and my friends get together, we drink beer, watch sports, and debate the merits of teen actors in crappy vampire flicks. I think we need to up our hangout time. This fan-made game takes place in between Ocarina of Time and Miura's Mask, the two Legend of Zelda games released on the N64, and it's been created by borrowing Ocarina's assets. The Missing Link fits right in with the aesthetic of the classic Zelda titles, and the game even has a launch trailer, which sets a similar tone to Miura's Mask. The game only takes about an hour to finish, but it is complete with a final boss and a credit sequence. And another cool feature of this story, in a playthrough video on YouTube, Emmanuel and CDI Fails, who also worked on the game, go through the adventure while also talking about the creative process. These guys made a brand new game, a launch trailer, a playthrough video, and a behind the scenes of all of their projects together. Again, I feel like I'm missing out in terms of my one-on-one -on -one time with my bros. Oh, friend! Oh, new friend! Please be my friend. Well, that's been the happenings of the week. My name's been Lorne Risley, and this has been Defunct Games News. I'm off to do some sleuthing right now. Never done any sleuthing before, so I do hope I sleuth well. Be sure to go and check out the Defunct Games Discord and indeed all the other videos on Defunct Games this week. Uh, I'll be back next week with more news, I hope, and probably some more information on what's going on. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, and thanks for watching. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Defunct Games News. Hmm, maybe that's a weird thing to say considering apparently I'm being investigated. Anyway, if you liked what you saw here, then you'll be happy to know that Lorne will return next Sunday for even more news. Now, here's the question I have for you. What's your favorite old school portable system? Yeah, I know a lot of people are probably going to point to the Game Boy brand, but I'm partial to both the Neo Geo Pocket Color and the Lynx. Ooh, the fact that this new portable plays games from both of those systems definitely makes it tempting. 
But that price! Oh, that price! Let me see your picks in the comments below. In other news, we'll be back tomorrow with the 101st episode of Game Over. What'll it be? Oh, all I can say is that it's the very opposite of the last episode. You'll see. I'm also finishing up my review of Destroy All Humans on PlayStation 4, so look for that in the coming days. If that sounds good to you, then I strongly recommend you click that subscribe button and support what we're doing here. Until then, 